Stanford University. So we're now heading into the, um, the crucial end phase of the semester. Um, so I guess we're now at the start of week nine. Um, so first of all, if I just do the sort of reminders, um, obviously everyone should keep working um, on their final projects dash assignment fours. Um, a couple of just notes on that. Um, so on Thursday, Rich is going to talk about dynamic memory networks. And while they're only one of several ways that you could go about approaching assignment four, um, they'll certainly be relevant material if you are doing assignment four, because it's an instance of the kind of architectures of sort of attention-based architectures that people can use for, think, for tasks like the reading comprehension question answering, like the squad data set. So watch out for that. Um, yeah, um, we've been trying to keep money in people's Azure accounts. Actually, our Microsoft rep, Christine, is here right now. Um, if you need to pester her, <laughs> um, pester about any problems. Um, and, you know, certainly um, contact us on Piazza if there are any issues. And we've been trying to be proactive at keeping things restocked. I know it's slightly frustrating if you go out of money and it then locks you out and we need to reset it, but um, we're doing our best. Um, Okay, and it's great that there are now lots of people that are clearly very actively using it and doing stuff, and that's super. We are very pleased to see that all happening. Um, okay, then for assignment four, um, so for the assignment four um, submissions, we're doing submissions on CoderLab, which is um, conveniently tied right into Azure as well. And so for assignment four, um, we've set up a leaderboard. Um, at least when I looked this morning, it only had one submission from it, which was from the people who set up the leaderboard, and they were only getting 2% on squad. So, you know, if you can get higher than 2% on squad, at least temporarily, um, you could be top of the leaderboard. Um, and so I hope people can try that out. Um, and so a couple of a couple of Percy Liang's um, RAs have been very actively working at helping us out of doing this Coda Lab um, Azure integration for using an assignment for. So big thank you to Percy um, and um, his RAs. Um, and so they've also made a couple of videos of how to use Coda Lab, um, that they're short videos that there's an announcement about on Piazza. So have a look about those. Okay, so then moving right along for today's lecture. Um, so for today's lecture, I'm going to talk about co-reference. Um, so when we did the mid-quarter survey, um, one of the things that a whole bunch of people complained about was that we actually weren't doing much linguistics and natural language content in this class. So today, it's getting a little bit late since it's the start of week nine. Um, I'm actually going to... Um, try to have some more linguistic content in the first half um, before going back to deep learning models for the same. I mean, I think that, I think that sort of comment in the mid-quarter evaluations was completely fair because the reality was in the first half of the class, it really was sort of just about all deep learning models all the time. I mean, I'm not sure I've yet worked out the perfect solution to that because the fact of the matter was we kind of felt when organizing the class that we were sort of on this treadmill where we had to get through more stuff in time for our next assignment. Um, and so that is what it is. But um, over the last couple of weeks, we'll try and have a bit more NLP content as we go along. Okay, um, so co-reference resolution is an instance of a task, and it's really the sort of only one that we're going to look at in any depth here, where we're working on a larger level of a text so that we're no longer just sort of trying to look at an individual sentence and say, okay, what's the subject and the object and parsing, or is this a company name? But we're trying to make um, sense of a bigger text and work out what's going on about that. And it's not the entirety of understanding long text, but it's sort of one of the most prominent things that you need to do as you go along. So in when we're doing co-reference resolution, the first thing that we're doing is working out all the mentions in the piece of text. So they're um, pieces of text, basically noun phrases, um, that refer um, to some 
entity in the world. And then once we've got those, we're trying to find the ones that refer to the, the same real world entity that co-refer. So there's one set of them here, which co-refer in this example to Barack Obama. And then there's another set, which are these ones here. And they're the ones that co-refer to Hillary Clinton. Okay, so um, that's our task of um, co-reference resolution. And so I thought next we could just go through, um, really get a sense of what goes on in co-reference resolution. I'll go through an example text. And this is where I signal to these guys here to flip me over to my other screen. Oh, look at that. Okay, so here's our example text. Um, this is from a short story by Shruti Rao called The Star. Now, I have to admit, since this isn't a literature class, I actually made some little cuts and edits to this story so I could more easily fit it in a larger font size on my slide. Um, so uh, the text is slightly mangled, but it's basically the story, um, part of the story. Um, so what have we got here when we do this, right? So um, first of all, we have the kind of named entities, which is precisely um, what you were finding in assignment three, right? So we have Banaja and Akila, and there's Akila, and there's Prajwal, Akash, Prajwal, Akash, Lord Krishna, I think there's a named entity, um, Akash. Um, so we've got all of those. Um, but then we have a lot of other kinds of phrases um, that refer um, in the text. So uh, the second prominent category is that we have pronouns. So there's they, um, and there's she, and then there's this one that's a pronoun that's a kind of a special pronoun, herself, um, and there's she, and him, and she, um, she, it, it. Um, and then I've mi noticed that I've missed at least one of the named entities. There's another named entity. There are probably other things I've missed, so you can tell me what I've missed. Okay, so those are both prominent categories, but that's not all there is. There's really a third category, which are then things that are mentions, um, but are done with common nouns, so that they're neither pronouns or named entities. So that's something like the local park, her, um, well, there's her son is such an example, um, the same school, the preschool, play. So there's sort of, you get in, an interesting thing is you get embedded ones, right? So the preschool play is a reference of a mention of an entity, but inside that um, there's the preschool, which is another mention of an entity. Um, oops. Um, okay, so there's the naughty child, um, a tree, um, the best tree, a brown t-shirt, brown trousers, the tree trunk, um, a large cardboard cutout. There's, um, okay, then there's a circular opening. There are red balls, man. Um, okay, um, so there are those ones. And then there are, you know, there are some other things that are common noun phrases, and it's not quite so clear whether they're actually mentions of anything in the world. So there's, you know, a couple of years. Is that a mention of anything in the world? Not quite so clear. And then there's this, um, a tree's foliage, which sort of doesn't really seem like it's referring to anything concrete in the world. So there are various complicated cases like that. And in particular, there's another one of those more complicated cases at the end, which I'll maybe come back to later, this the nicest tree. Okay, but somehow we work out what all our mentions are, and then the task we want to do is to start to then work out um, which ones co-refer. So for a start, there's, for a start, there's then Vinaja here, okay. Um, then um, what's the next thing that refers to Vanaja? Her. 
her, yeah, so there's this her, which I guess I forgot to mark when I was marking the pronouns, so embedded in the NP, her son. So again, you can get mentions and side mentions, right? There's that her, okay. Um, is there anything else that is co-referent? She, okay, so there's that she there, and then the next one is herself. Okay, right, so, and so here we have these reflexive pronouns, and so reflexive pronouns are kind of special because they always co-refer very closely back to each other, as in that example, right, she resigned herself. Um, okay, so there's she again, um, then she made, um, she attached, Okay, so that goes right through. Okay, so then we have, um, now we have Aquila, uh, which is Aquila. So sometimes you just, um, right, um, sometimes you just get um, names being repeated as names. Um, are there other things that co-refer with Aquila? Maybe not. Um, note that this is kind of part of how it's um, tricky, right? Because, well, here at the beginning, um, we have um, the names of two women. Akilah's name is actually repeated in the second sentence, but somehow we have to understand enough of the text beyond that to understand that all these other references to a she and a her aren't referring to Akilah at all. They're all referring to Vanaja. Okay. So we have those, so we have these two entity chains, and then we have some more entity chains, right? So, um, so if we go to the next one, the local park, um, that one is just a singleton, right? Nothing else um, refers, I believe, to the local park. So something for a lot of background mentions, things will just be mentioned once and never repeated. Okay, um, and so then we have, um, Prajwa, who, who sort of appears twice here, right? Like there's Akila's son, which is sort of a descriptive term, and then his name Prajwa. So that's generally referred to as apposition. So we get two mentions of him right there. Um, and then where else is Prajwa appearing? Well, once his name is right here, um, are there other places that Prajwa appears? Okay, so here's a complicated one. There's this they, which refers to two people, right? That refers to Prajwal and Akash. Um, so that, that's a phenomenon, maybe I'll start putting Akash in as well, um, right? So we have this phenomenon here of when you have split antecedents. So you can have a plural they that's referring back to two things that are disassociated with each other, right? They're just discontinuous in different places. So, you know, when we start looking at COREF algorithms that NLP people use a bit later, one of the embarrassing things that you'll notice is that the standard algorithms that we use just can't handle this kind of split antecedents, that you're looking at a mention and you're trying to decide what to make it co-referent to, and you just can't get ones like that right. So that's a bit embarrassing, but that's the current state of natural language processing. Okay, what else is co-referent to Prajwal? Okay, we'll go on. Um, okay, so Akash appears a lot, right? Um, so we have Akash, um, Akash, him, Akash, um, okay, so he um, goes through all the tree. Okay, so what other entities are there that occur multiple times here? The tree, okay. Um, and so this, if you think about it, there's definitely here a tree. Um, but if you think about it, which of these things count as mentions in the real world and which ones you 
one of Dima's co-referent is sort of actually tricky, right? I mean, if you just look, half look at it, you just think, okay, um, anytime I see the word tree in a noun phrase, I'm just gonna say all of those uh, co-referent with each other. But that doesn't actually seem to be right, right? Because, you know, when it was here, a kash was to be a tree. That's not talking about any specific tree that's a referent in the world. That's sort of some intentional description. Um, she resigned herself to make a kash the best tree that anybody had ever seen. Again, that doesn't seem to be referring to any particular tree that's extant at any time. That's some kind of um, descriptive text. Um, on the other hand, when it's gone down to she bought him a brown t-shirt and brown trousers to represent the tree, you know, this is now, you know, it's an abstract tree costume, obviously, but that actually seems to be a real tree that's a thing in the world that you can point at. Um, so um, that's a real thing. Um, and then, well, what about when it says a tree's foliage? Is that referring to the, the tree that she's building? It's kind of a little bit unclear. Um, okay, but by the time it says she attached red balls to it, um, that's clearly a reference to the tree that she's making, and that's a, it's a good, clear one. Um, but then the last sentence says, it truly was the nicest tree. So for that one, um, the it, is clearly again referring to the tree that she's constructed. So that one is clear. The question is what to do about the nicest tree. And to be honest, if, you know, like for various other NLP tasks, um, for co-reference resolution, people have constructed data sets where people have essentially done what I'm trying to do in live in front of you as to identify mentions and then say which ones are co-referent. Um, and so what we have here for something like it was, it truly was the nicest tree. The nicest tree is referred to as a predicate nominal. So it's something in the form of a noun phrase, but it's actually a, a property that is being predicated of the subject. It is the nicest tree. Um, and so some of the data sets that people use for co-reference, they declare predicate nominals like this to be co-referent to the subject and therefore it would be purple. But there's kind of an argument that that's actually just wrong and the predicate nominal is actually kind of a descriptive property of the nicest tree and it's not actually referent to anything and so then it'd be, um, that wouldn't be what you're wanting to do. Um, but I'll leave my purple there um, for the moment. Um, okay, are there any other um, interesting things I should comment on. Um, there's obviously more things that we haven't done yet. Um, I could choose a different color. Um, so, you know, there's... Yeah, so I mean, there are obviously lots of other things that are mentioned that aren't in change, right? So something like um, Akasha's face is a mention that's a singular mention. Um, this a circular opening, I guess, is a kind of an interesting one because it seems like that is an entity in the real world, but it's an entity that's a whole in the world as opposed to a thing that's in the world. So there are lots of real world complications um, as to how things pan out in co-reference. Um, but that's sort of an idea of the task and the problems. Does that make sense? Okay. I will go on by, from there by sending back my person. Awesome. Okay. Right. So what, what we've seen from that is that, you know, basically what we're working with is the noun phrases. Most of them um, refer to entities in the world. There are many of them that in pairs refer to the same entity of the world, and they're the ones we're going to call co-referent. And then the other interesting thing that's different to what we tried to do with 
named entity recognition is that there are lots of cases in which you get nesting, right? So when you have CFO of prime core, that prime core is a mention, but CFO of prime core is also a mention. Um, his pay is a mention, but the his inside is also a mention, and we've got another one there. So you get lots of these nested examples. I mean, in truth, you'd get the same thing happening also in named entity recognition. And some people, including a former student of mine, Jenny Finkel, actually looked at that because there are a whole bunch of cases um, that also in sort of names of things, when you have something like Palo Alto Utility Company, that you have the organization which is Palo Alto Utility Company, and inside that you have a location that's Palo Alto. Though in general, in NER, you, people just do it flat, and you kind of lose those embedded locations. But if you're wanting to follow along co-reference links like John Smith and his pay, that you're sort of really losing a lot in your ability to interpret text if you aren't dealing with those embedded mentions and so normally people do. Um, so co-reference resolution is a really key task. It's used in all sorts of um, places. Essentially anywhere where you want to do a fuller job of text understanding, you need to have um, co-reference. So if you want to sort of understand a story like the story of the star, well, you definitely need to be able to follow along the co-reference. It helps in lots of other tasks. So if you want to do machine translation, um, if you're doing machine translation from one of the many languages like Turkish that um, don't distinguish gender in pronouns and you want to then translate into say English and it does have gender, um, then what you need to do is follow along the co-reference change to be work out um, which ones should be he and which ones should be she. Um, it's been um, observed and complained about by a number of people recently that current MT systems don't do that. If you take Turkish and you translate into English, everything comes out male, sorry. Um, that's the state of NLP on that. Um, so um, text sent summarization, including things like web snippets, right? If you're trying to cut out a sort of a little snippet to put on web results and it contains a pronoun in it, it'd be much cleverer if you could replace it with its reference so it's interpretable. Um, and then also tasks like information extraction, relation extraction, question answering. Um, this doesn't apply to the, the squad task the way it's formulated, um, but a lot of the time we have questions like, who married Claudia Ross in 1971? And you start searching the text for the answer to that question, and you say, yeah, I found the right place to look. Here's this sentence, he married Claudia Ross in 1971, and you're sure you've got the answer if only you could work out what he was co-referent to, and that's when you need co-reference resolution. Um, so when we've made all of these attempts to link things together, I'll just explain now how we go about evaluating co-reference resolution. So effectively, co-reference um, scoring, it's kind of like clustering. And basically, any metric that people have used for cluster evaluation, people have also tried to use for co-reference resolution. And so the one that we're going to emphasize in today's lecture is one called B cubed, which is one of the widely used clustering evaluation metrics. So what you have here, I mean, I've sort of just duplicated it on both sides so I can show you precision and recall, is so the colors of my little balls are the gold answers of what's correct, and then the circles that I've drawn around it is how my system has decided to gather things that it thinks it's co-reference. And so what you do for the B cubed um, metric is um, you sort of align system clusters and and the gold clusters. So I've chosen to align this system cluster with the blue color here, which I've shown by that black around the circle. And then I say, okay, well, of the things that I put in my system cl cluster, what is the precision of what I put in there? And well, it turns out that four out of the five of them are blue and one of them is pink. And so I say my precision is four fifths for this cluster. Um, then I do it the other way around and I work out a recall. So I say, well, I aligned the blue things with this 
system cluster. And well, actually this system cluster only contains four out of the six blue things. So my recall for that alignment is then four sixths or two thirds. And I'm gonna put those together in an F measure and that's then gonna give me the B cubed measure. And so that's sort of the main idea. It's just a little bit more complex than that. I mean, first of all, obviously I want to do it not only with that cluster, I also want to align this cluster with the oranges and say they're precision and recall one because they're completely correct. And this cluster and the pinks, and then I want to say precision five sevenths and recall, wait, no, precision four sixths, sorry, can't count, and recall um, four fifths, it's the opposite way around. Um, and then, um, there, so there are a couple of other tricks. One is um, that you're weighting the different precisions and recalls based on the size of the clusters. So um, it matters more to get high precision on really big clusters. Um, the other bit that I sort of slightly glossed over is I said, well, you align these system found clusters with a gold cluster. Um, and as you might know from some other class, class, in the general case, if you're sort of doing a bipartite alignment of things of that sort, that's actually an NP-hard problem. So it's sort of almost impossible to guarantee that you've found the optimal um, B cube score. So normally what you're actually finding in your system is a, a sort of a lower bound on a possible B cube score. But in practice, providing your system is reasonably good, it's fairly easy in a greedy manner to start aligning together system clusters and gold clusters, starting with the ones that you did best. And in practice, there's greedy matching software that's used for B cubed, which seems to nearly always work and give you the right answer. And so that hasn't been a huge problem in practice. Um, that's only one measure that's been used for co-reference. There are a whole bunch of other ones um, that have been used, most of which relate to clustering algorithms, evaluations that people have used elsewhere. Okay, um, so before getting to the halfway point, I then wanted to say just a little bit more about what goes on in co-reference from a sort of a linguistic point of view. And this is actually a little bit interesting and hasn't actually been much dealt with by NLP systems. So what kind of things do we have? So we have referring expressions, so things that directly refer like John Smith as named entities or the president as common nouns. We then have things that aren't directly referring but are sort of variables that are contingent on something else. And there are ones that are free variables, so his pay, that's sort of a free variable, but it's references dependent on the reference of Smith. And then we have these reflexives, the bound variables, um, which are sort of closely connected with something nearby. Um, and so in linguistic theory, most of the work has dealt with these variables and trying to interpret what they are going to be co-referent with. Um, Whereas in doing practical co-reference over real texts, um, there's quite a lot of pronouns, but a lot of the action is actually dealing with these proper noun and common noun referring expressions. And it turns out in practice getting these guys right is actually harder than getting these guys right, um, which is sort of interesting. Um, so things to notice, not all noun phrases are referring. So if we have every dancer twisted her knee, um, her knee does not refer to anything because it's sort of embedded under this sort of quantifier of every dancer. That's perhaps more clearly seen if you look at the second example, no dancer twisted her knee. There's no her knee being talked about, right? So that's a, non, a clearly non-referring noun phrase. Okay, and similarly, no dancer isn't a noun phrase that refers to any dancer either. Um, so um, in linguistics, people normally distinguish two relations. So one of them is co-reference, which is when two mentions refer to the same entity in the world, and that has nothing to do with the structure of text. And the other one is a relation of 
anaphora, which is a textual relation when a term, the anaphor, refer, gains reference with respect to another term, the antecedent. So you're using it for its interpretation. Um, so if you go back to Greek roots, an anaphor meant that you had this word whose interpretation was dependent on something that preceded it in the text. And so anaphora was distinguished from the opposite relationship which was called cataphora, where actually you had a dependent term that was dependent on something after it in the text. So here's a lovely example of cataphora from Oscar Wilde. Um, from the corner of the divan of Persian saddlebags on which he was lying smoking, as was his custom, innumerable cigarettes, Lord Henry Wotton could just catch the gleam of the honey-sweet and honey-coloured blossoms of a laburnum. This is a laburnum, in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, um, so this is a beautiful example of cataphora um, because the um, the referential noun phrase is Lord Henry Wotton, and then both he and his uh, then cataphors on the following um, Lord Henry Wotton. Um, again, it turns out in nearly all of our NLP systems, we never try and do this. So we're always coming across um, mentions, and then we're trying to assign them to something before them. So we always treat them as um, backward-looking anaphora, so we'd be actually hoping to say this he doesn't refer to anything before it, and then we'd be later on saying Lord Henry Wotton is um, co-referent um, co with the he, but that's actually sort of linguistically bad and doesn't make terribly much sense. Um, okay, um, so, um, so a lot of the time things that are anaphoric a co-referential because the textual dependence is one of identity. So an anaphor is, is co-referential with the th its antecedent. But that's not always true either. So you have things, you have anaphoric relations that aren't identity relationships and then they're not co-referential. And so here's an example of this. Um, we went to see a concert last night. The tickets were really expensive. So the tickets here, is an anaphor that's dependent on reference to this antecedent because it's meaning the tickets for the concert um, were really expensive. Um, but it's not an identity relationship. So those are referred to as bridging anaphors. Um, and there's been a little NLP work on trying to interpret bridge bridging anaphors, but extremely little. For most of the co-reference systems, a concert is um, a mention of an entity, the tickets are a mention of an entity, and you just don't learn the relationship um, between them. Okay, so they're really kind of two different things. So you can have anaphoric relationships in the text, which may or may not imply co-reference. You know, 90% of the time they do, but not always. And then you have co co-referential relationships where two things in the text refer to the same thing in the world, but that may just be because they refer to the same thing in the world. There isn't necessarily any textual dependence relationship between them. Um, and so something that you might like to think about is, you know, maybe those two phenomena should actually be handled somewhat differently in our models. And, you know, the truth is for sort of most of the models we build at the moment, they're really not handled differently. You could hope if you cross your fingers really hard that somehow the way our neural network model works will end up treating the pronouns, which are normally anaphors, sort of differently to the way it's treating um, you know, the various mentions of Akash, which were just um, co-reference relationships. But you know, it's sort of across your fingers really hard. There's nothing really in our model structure that's sort of really distinguishing these two notions. Okay, so in the second half, I'll then get into saying how we build co-reference systems. Um, but before we do that, um, we're on to the research highlight, and James is gonna talk about that. So, hello everyone. Um, today's research highlight will be summarizing source code using a neural attention model. This paper was published in ACL 2016, and it's by um, authors from University of Washington Computer Science and Engineering Department. Um, so the main task in the data set that they define is to generate sentences that describe C Sharp and um, SQL queries. And they use a data set from Stack Overflow. Um, 
Essentially, what they do is they just query the whole data set for all the, all the posts that have tags that have C Sharp, SQL, or database or Oracle in them. Um, well, as you would expect, like just doing this naively doesn't work very well because there's lots and lots of noise in the data set. So one of their cleaning steps that they do beforehand is to remove all the posts where the question and the text doesn't actually have any relevance with the content of the code. For example, like people often ask questions about code such as like, how can I make this code run faster? And in that sense, that, that wouldn't be a very good summary at all. A second thing that they do in order to, a more technical thing that they do is they do, they actually try to parse the code. Um, in the sense that like, a lot of code contains like literal roles. Um, they have specific variable names, um, things like this, which are not very general for a like general system to try to summarize code. And what they do in this case is they actually replace the literal roles with their types. They also replace the table and column names with something more generic. And then they also remove inline comments in order to make the system more less reliant on those things. And two examples of the code are shown um, on the side, where one is um, C sharp code for like getting the width of a text block in. Um, yeah, some view, I think. And the second is um, source code for like SQL where you're trying to get the second largest element on the table. And specifically, like they define two tasks that they're actually going to try to attempt. And these are to generate text, um, specifically a sentence to describe some code sequence um, that maximizes a scoring function. A second task is um, the information retrieval task, which is to go through the essentially their core purpose and find the code snip, uh, find the sentence or find the code snippet that most closely relates to the input question, which is, would be in natural language. Um, the scoring function is shown to the side. Um, it's essentially the product of the next word probabilities. Um, and these are um, proportional to what the output that we get from their model, which um, takes into account the hidden states of the LSTM and also some attention on the source code. Um, specifically, here's an example of um, how they generate their text using their model, which is, they call code NN. Um, you feed in some like null like starting token, and then you make some form of prediction based on the attention and based on the LSTM um, to get some the next word um, n1, and then you keep doing this iteratively again and again, and this is how they generate their full sequence. So to evaluate their system, they did uh, first on the text generation side, they compared against them. Um, well, they used existing MT metrics such as Meteor and Blue, and they took some existing um, translation systems, some an information retrieval baseline, a system called Moses, which is uh, some phrase a phrase based translation system, and then um, a previous model that also Neonet, and they found that their model gets um, higher scores on essentially Meteor and Blue. And then they also did something that's uh, a user study where they got five people and they had them rank the result. Uh, like manually score the results um, in terms of like naturalness, which is how well does the sentence actually like read in terms of fluency, and informativeness in terms of um, how much of the content of the code was actually captured by the summary. And they found that their uh, model unsurprisingly does better than existing approaches. Um, and then their information retrieval task, um, they used a metric called mean reciprocal rank, and they compared against some um, existing like previous papers and an existing baseline out there. Um, so what's more interesting is the actual example outputs that the model generates. Um, here's an example of uh, C-sharp code, which is uh, to get, or sorry, to add, a children, add children to some tree node. Um, and in particular, like this is C-sharp, so tree node is actually part of a I think, tree view. And in this case, some um, code NN actually gets pretty close where they recognize that um, these tree nodes are related to tree views, but uh, doesn't didn't quite get the idea that you're trying to add instead of get them all. Um, a second example where the code NN actually got the right result is um, this query where you're trying to select random rows from a table and um, code NN actually gets it exactly. Cool, and that's all. Thank you, James. Okay, so now um, for the, the remaining sort of 40 minutes, um, it's now algorithms to try and um, do um, co-reference resolution. And so I guess for about the first 15 minutes, I'm going to sort of say something about sort of um, sort of the history of ways of doing um, um, co-reference resolution, NAFRA resolution in general, um, and just the sort of space and traditional methods. And then sort of for the last 25 minutes, I'm going to talk about one particular way of doing it, um, which is actually from a paper that Kevin Clark did. Okay, um, so sort of the 
most famous thing in the space of co-reference resolution, though actually just an algorithm for determining the pronominal anaphora resolution, i.e. working out what um, you know, he, him, she, hers, it's referred to, um, is an algorithm that was proposed by a long time ago by Jerry Hobbs, um, which these days um, is normally referred to as the Hobbs algorithm, but actually um, in Jerry Hobbs's paper, he refers to as the naive algorithm for a reason that I will explain in a minute. Um, and so this algorithm, um, I'm not going to read through it. It's a, it's a complex mechanistic procedure for deciding what a pronoun refers to. So you begin at the noun phrase, above, so it's assuming a syntactic parse of the sentence, begin at the noun phrase immediately above the pronoun, go up the tree the first n, p, or s, call this x and the path p, traverse all branches below x to the left, blah, blah, blah. and this is an all of it. It keeps on going on the next page. Um, and it's got go-tos, go to step four. Um, you know, um, so the sort of embarrassing thing is that um, not in the system I'm going to present at the end part of class, but if you look at the sort of machine learning approaches um, to co-reference resolution that were done in the 2000s and the early, the first half of the 2010s, nearly all of them use this algorithm as a feature, right? So if you had a regular statistical classifier, you can take any kind of little subroutine and sort of put its judgment in as a feature into your logistic regression. And it turned out that what this calculated was sort of a useful enough approximation to getting out most likely, um, co most likely anaphoric relationships out of syntactic trees that most machine learning systems use this and got value out of it as a feature. So here's the kind of idea of how it was meant to work. So Niall Ferguson is a prolific, well-paid and uh, is prolific, well-paid and a snappy dresser. Stephen Moss hated him. Okay, so we want to, so here's a him and you're wanting to work out what that's co-referent to. And so you start at this noun phrase here. And so what it said was that you started from this noun phrase and you went up to the next S or NP um, and you called that um, X and the path that you'd gone up P. Um, and then it says um, traverse um, branches below X to the left of P propose as antecedent any NP that has an NP or S between it and X. Um, so I traverse things to the left and I find here a noun phrase, um, but that doesn't have anything else in between it. Um, and so therefore it's not a candidate. And so um, at that point, I'm going to be at the highest S in the sentence and I'm going to traverse the parse trees of the previous sentences in the order of recency and I traverse each tree left to right breadth first. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff embedded in this very complex mechanistic procedure, but you know, most of it is sort of correct and gets first order linguistics right. And so what's going on here? So what's going on here when we are sort of, so when we see him, the first thing to suspect is maybe it refers to something to the left in this same sentence. But that's where the kind of linguistic constraints on pronouns come in, right? So that if Stephen Moss referred to him, you couldn't have said him, you would have needed to say, himself, right? You have to use a reflexive there. Um, so that's why it says, unless there's some intervening NP or S um, in between, it's not a candidate anymore. But precisely if there's a more complex sentence structure, it would be a candidate. So if you had something like a more complex noun phrase in which Stephen Moss was a modifier, then co-reference would become possible. So if it was something like Stephen Moss's brother hated him, then it'd be possible for him to refer to Stephen Moss, right? Um, and so that would be captured because then there would be an extra NP node 
um, in, in between here and then it'd be okay. So that didn't work and so we went backwards. And so then again, now it's sort of using softer heuristics, but they're heuristics that are usually right. So it's said to go backwards to sentences in order of recency. So if the antecedent isn't in the current sentence, it's most likely in the immediately preceding sentence. So you look there first. And then it says within the sentence, go from left to right. Well, what's going on there? There's sort of an obliqueness hierarchy in sentences, and actually within a sentence, a subject, which at least in English is on the left side, is more likely to be the antecedent than something that's an object or an indirect object or object of a preposition that's buried down here. So it's saying the first thing that you should try is Niall Ferguson. And so that's then a candidate. It doesn't get disqualified on page two from reasons of gender or anything like that. And so we propose it as an answer and um, the Hobbes algorithm gets it right. Um, and so, you know, the Hobbes algorithm gets the right answer for pronouns about 80% of the time. It's actually pretty good. Of course, sometimes it gets it wrong. It's easy to come up with sentences that it won't get it right for. Um, so I just wanted to, um, before going on, deviate um, for a minute and talk about um, what Jerry Hobbs was actually interested in. So what Jerry Hobbs was actually interested in was knowledge based pronominal co-reference. And so from the early days of AI, there'd been sort of observations about how to actually get co-reference right in many cases, you actually have to understand sentences. And so there was this famous pair of sentences um, which was proposed by Terry Winograd, who until very recently was on the Stanford faculty, though he's, he'd kind of dropped out of doing NLP and had moved on to HCI. And so Terry, contrasted these two sentences. The city council refused the women a permit because they feared violence, and the city council refused the women a permit because they advocated violence. Um, this was back in the 60s and 70s when there was more protests around, I guess. Um, so anyway, so in the first sentence, the natural reading is um, the they is co-referent between the city, with the, the city council, and in the second sentence, the natural reasoning is, reading is with the they being co-referent with the women, right? Um, and the crucial thing to notice is this isn't something that the Hobbes naive algorithm could possibly get right, because both of these sentences have completely identical structure. Um, and so the answer that was suggested at the time was, well, what we actually need to do is have um, knowledge of the world and be able to sort of represent these actions and representing relationships that are likely to occur and that we just need to know, we have to sort of understand about city councils and permits to understand that if you're refusing a permit, that would happen if someone was advocating violence, but it wouldn't happen um, if someone, you know, if it, it would happen if the, if the people who would be getting the permit were doing the advocation of violence. And so this is an idea that people have actually tried to resurrect recently. Um, so Hector Levesque is an old, a good old fashioned AI guy. And I guess he gave an invited talk in 2013 where he sort of suggested, gee, we should kind of try and get back to these kind of win the grad sentences and actually be trying to understand them as interesting co-reference challenges. And so people have tried to more recently run a win a grad schema challenge. Um, so really this was what Jerry Hobbs um, was interested in. And so actually why he proposed his naive algorithm, um, it was actually one of the first instances of NLP when someone said, gee, before proposing something really complex, I should have a baseline. So I've got a good baseline to compare against as to how well something simple works. Um, and what he discovered was um, the kind of systems he built couldn't possibly beat his baseline because trying to do knowledge-based um, pronominal co-reference um, was way too hard um, for what could be done um, back in the 1970s. Um, but this is what he wrote about it. Um, so he said, the naive approach is quite good. Computationally speaking, it will be a long time before a semantically based algorithm is sophisticated enough to perform as well, and these results set a very high standard for any other approach to aim for. 
Yet there is every reason to pursue a semantically based approach. The naive algorithm does not work. Anyone can think of examples where it fails. In these cases, it not only fails, it gives no indication that it has failed and offers no help in finding the real antecedent. So in one sense, um, since 1978, we have progress um, because we now have um, algorithms that are significantly better than the Hobbes naive algorithm. So, you know, we've passed that bar um, for at least a decade. So that's a good news. Um, on the other hand, um, Jerry Hobbs could um, very viably argue that actually this second paragraph that I quoted there hasn't been addressed whatsoever because um, we're writing, you know, they might have more machine learning in them, but we're writing the same kind of mechanistic algorithms that usually get things right, sometimes get things wrong, and um, that's just how it is. Um, and we don't really sort of have any way of telling when it's failing. Okay, so how do people do co-reference? Um, so there are different ways that people have co um, approached the co-reference problem. So actually the most common way of doing it are what are referred to as mentioned pair models, and that's what we're gonna look at um, for the end part of this class. So we try and work out all the co-reference relationships by just making a sequence of pairwise links. So we're going to take pairs of mentions and say, are these co-referent or not, yes or no? So we're doing binary classification decisions independently. And then as a result of those binary decisions, we sort of induce a kind of clustering of mentions into entities. And we just do that in a simple deterministic way. We just sort of join everything together into a lump that's been put together by these binary decisions and we just sort of say, and they all close together by transitivity. There are a couple of other approaches that people have used um, for co-reference resolution. Rather than simply doing binary yes-no decisions, another choice is to say that you can actually use a ranking algorithm. So, um, Something that's gone very prominent in certain areas of machine learning but you kind of don't cover in your basic ML class is doing ranking problems. But they're sort of come up in a lot of places. Think things like um, Netflix recommending you a movie, um, Google rep recommending you a web page, right? All of those things are ranking problems. And so you can think of co-ref as a ranking problem because if you have a pronoun, well, it should be um, co-referent with something and maybe there are seven prior mentions in the document and then you're doing a ranking task as to which one of those seven it would be. And then there's a third way of doing co-reference resolution, which is sort of arguably really the right way, which is what I've referred to as entity mention models. And that's to sort of explicitly think about the mention, oh, sorry, the entities. So they're actual real entities that your discourse is about. And when you see a mention, you should be saying that's a mention of a particular entity, or maybe this mention introduces a new entity into your discourse, and you've sort of got this set of underlying entities. So in some sense, your entities are your clusters of mentions, but you're actually giving them sort of first class status as objects in your model, rather than them just sort of appearing as a result of some linking process. And so a number of people then tried to work on models that sort of explicitly represent entities and then sort of do some kind of joint inference or have some kind of generative model of how the mentions are created from the entities. Um, yeah, but the simplest case and um, what we'll look at mainly are these mentioned pair models. And so mentioned pair models are normally trained as supervised learning models. So what you do is you have some data, um, you have mentions, and so there's sort of this prior problem of finding the mentions, but we can roughly think of the mentions as our noun phrases. Um, and then here's a he, and what we're gonna say is that's gonna be co-referent with something. Well, if we have gold standard data, um, we'll know that the right answer um, would be either Mr. Obama or the president, because both of them are co-referent. And if you have multiple choices, you'd normally just choose the nearest one, and you say the correct answer for this one is the president. Um, and then you have negative examples, which are things that are not co-referent. So Milwaukee is a negative example. So you 
get positive and negative examples, you train a binary classifier, and you're done. And so for conventional coref, um, people then used all sorts of features that were sort of indicators of co-reference. So for pronouns in English, there are things like person number and gender agreement. So Jack gave Mary a gift, she was excited. That has to be Mary because of gender um, rather than Jack. Um, there are softer notions like semantic compatibility. So if there's a reference to the mining conglomerate, that could be co-referent with the company because that's sort of semantically um, compatible. That's much harder to do. Some things that we've already mentioned are sort of hard syntactic constraints. So John bought him a new car. Him can't be John. That'd have to be himself. So that's a feature we can use. Um, but there are lots of softer things which I was mentioning before, right? So um, recency is a good indicator. John went to a movie. Jack went as well. He was not busy. That sort of sounds like it was probably Jack that wasn't busy, at least to me. And that's sort of presumably a recency effect. Um, but it's not really categorical, it has to be. Um, subjects are commonly preferred. John went to a movie with Jack, he was not busy. I think the most natural reading of that is that John was not busy. So that's sort of preferring subjects. Parallelism, John went with Jack to a movie, Joe went with him to a bar. I think the most natural reading of that is that that is um, Jack that Joe went with, and that sort of seems to make sense, not according to grammatical role preference, which would give you John, but in terms of the sort of parallelism of the two sentences and interpreting it that way. So there are sort of lots of linguistic features that you can start to build features from and sort of put them into a classifier and try and determine re co-reference, and people built these things where Loosely, there are sort of big logistic regression classifiers with hundreds of thousands of features that try to capture some of these kind of relationships. Um, but for the last 25 minutes, what I wanted to tell you then is about what people have done with deep learning and co-reference. And the answer to that in two words is not much. Um, so at, at this point in time, there are basically four papers that have tried to use um, neural networks, deep learning to do co-reference um, by two authors. So there's um, Sam Weissman at Harvard who's um, worked on the problem in a couple of papers. And then there's Kevin, um, who's worked on the problem in a couple of papers. Um, and so there are some sort of connections and there are some different approaches here. I mean, in particular, um, there are a couple of papers, both sort of Sam's second paper and Kevin's first paper, which were both trying to do entity mention models and actually trying to um, have explicit representations for entities and doing more global inference in terms of entities. And you know, I think most people who've tried to do co-reference a bit really do believe that surely there should be good power from doing things jointly over these entities and um, that should give some real advantages. In practice, you know, it's repeatedly sort of proven hard to get sustained advantages from doing that. And so there's sort of been this continuing use of entity pair, sorry, mention pair, sorry, mention pair models, which are very simple to implement, and you keep on seeming to work out how to make them work well. Um, so Kevin's most recent paper um, is actually back to a mention pair model, and that produces great results. And I thought I'd actually show that one, not because it's the most, not only because it's the most recent and best, but because it might be kind of a good chance to sort of show a couple of other techniques of doing things in the context of deep learning. Okay, so here we go. Um, so the first couple of bits um, are maybe fairly similar, right? So we want to find these co-reference clusters, and so we're going to be doing it simply as a mention ranking model where we want to assign a score to each candidate antecedent. So we want to be saying, what does um, my refer to? And we're picking um, the preceding mentions, and then we add on one extra candidate, because for any mention you have, one possibility is this is a new referent in the discourse, and it's not co-referent with anything that appears before it. So we then have this new up the end, um, so you can say this is a new referent. And so for each of these um, mentioned pairs, we're going to build a model that scores them. And so 
that it's just going to score a pair of mentions for co-reference independently still and give them a score. And then what we're going to do is say, well, which one has the best score? Okay, that's putting I and my together. And so that one we're going to join. And so then we can literally just go through the mentions in the discourse from left to right and run this mention pair classifier on each successive mention and sort of then assign them and that will give us our um, model. And so then the question is, um, how can we go about um, designing and training a good mention pair classifier? And yeah, of course, at the end of the day, you know, our actual set of co-referent things will just be the result of these local decisions. So if we say I is a new thing, Nada is a new thing, he refers to Nada, my refers to I, um, she refers to my, then the result of that is we've sort of constructed these two co-referent clusters as a result of these local decisions, and as a result of imputing transitivity. So we're then saying that she is also co-referent to I. Okay, so I hope the setting in general is clear enough. Um, how did we, how was that done? And so for doing the, um, doing the neural mention pair model, um, this is being done as a feed forward network. It's sort of, in some sense, it's no more complicated than that. But what are the parts that go into it? So down the bottom, we have two kinds of things. So firstly, um, for both the mention and the candidate antecedent, we have embeddings of words. Um, and so this model didn't use any kind of recurrent neural network or something like that that goes through the mentions. I mean, Kevin actually experimented with that a little bit um, and found no particular value in it. And so it actually kind of like um, the dependency parser of Dan Cheese that you did in assignment two, if you remember back to that one, it sort of picks out particular words and uses their word representations. So it'll use the head word of the mention, the last word of the mention and things like that. And so that gives you some word embedding features. And so the word embedding features are going to be good for capturing similarities. I mean, certainly when it's just the same word, right? If they both say, Akash, you'll get that. But you hope to also get things like conglomerate and company having similar word representations um, that you can do things with. But there are some relationships that that's clearly not capturing. If you think of some of those properties that we've already mentioned, like recency and grammatical role and things like that, they're not being captured. So there are also then a few features that are calculated for each mention that are also put into it. So after that, it's really a straightforward um, architecture. It's a deep feed forward network of sort of relus at every level that take you up to the top. And then at the top, you're turning that into a score, which is a numeric score for how likely it is to be co-referent. Um, yeah, so, so the tradition, you know, compared to traditional systems, the number of handcrafted features is getting smaller over time, but there's still just a number that really help. Distance is one that really helps. Um, and if you have any kind of dialogue, doing tracking of speakers and change of speakers also really helps you, and you don't just get for free out of word embeddings. Okay. Um, users pre-trained word embeddings. I mentioned the no RNNs, deep net network, dropout. Um, so that part is all pretty straightforward. So what's the novel, um, more interesting part of the, the model? And so that was to say, well, you aren't necessarily going to do well if you just train such a model as a straightforward classifier. You either got this decision right or wrong. You could do that, but that's non-optimal. And the reason why it's non-optimal is that some mistakes matter much, much more than others. Because, you know, when even though the mention pair classifier is just an independent classifier of a pair of mentions, the reality is that as a result of making a sequence of those um, mention pair classifications, you're then going to end up with these clusterings of mentions that are your entities. 
and your, the quality of your co-reference is going to be decided by how good are those clusters and mentions that are your entities that you formed at the end of the day. And so what that means in particular is that some mistakes you can make are really bad mistakes. So if you've started along and saying Bill Clinton co-referent with he, Clinton co-referent with he, and Hillary's co-referent with Clinton, her, you know, if you then said, oh, let's make these two Clintons co-referent, that sort of collapses your two partial clusterings together into one huge hairball, and that sort of destroys your ability to kind of do discourse interpretation because you've kind of collapsed um, two individuals in your discourse into one individual. So that's going to really destroy you. But there are other ways in which you can make um, little errors which don't really matter. So it was raining but the car stayed dry because it was undercover. So this first it's what gets referred to as a pleonastic it that it's just not really referential at all. Just somehow in English we like to have subjects so rather than saying just raining as you would in many other languages you say it is raining. Um, but it's not really referring to anything. Um, so you know it was a mistake to make that co-referent to the car, but it sort of doesn't really matter. It's not going to have destroyed your understanding of the dialogue. You've just got sort of one thing wrong. So that's a minor error. And so the question is, could we train a model um, so that it's actually sensitive to these ideas of what are major errors and minor errors? And the secret to that is to say, well, that means that we can't work out the loss simply of individual decisions. We've got to work out what impact those decisions have at the end of the day. And if you're in that sort of situation in which you kind of can't locally work out the loss of individual decisions, but you have to sort of wait around and say, how does things turn out later in the day? Because I'll have to use that. That's the space in which you need to use reinforcement learning. So, and so that's um, one possibility um, that this paper talks about. So, um, you know, previously people had done something about this problem, and I'll show that in just a minute, which is to say, gee, some of these decisions are more important than others. Um, and so we could come up with heuristics to decide how important different things are, and then we can, for different kinds of errors, we can kind of set hyperparameters to weight those kind of errors and adjust those to maximize our performance. And to some extent that you can do that, but it seems like the more right and principled way to do it would be to say, no, this can be done as a reinforcement learning problem in which we want to be finding local decisions which lead to the end of the day as a good clustering so that our reward function for the reinforcement learning is do we get a good clustering at the end of the day. And if we do that, um, we can get rid of having to sort of manually find um, sort of things to weight and setting the weights of them with hyperparameters. And we can get some get gains, not huge gains, but some gains from doing that. So the kind of thing that had been done in prior work is to say, well, there are different classes of co-reference decisions and their importance we might want to um, weight differently. So the kind of mistakes you can make is you can do a false new. You can claim that something is a new cluster when really it should have been made co-referent to something. So that's failing to cluster when you should have. There's a false anaphoric. Your something should have been its own cluster, but you've joined it to an existing cluster. And then there's a wrong link where you should have been joining it with some previously established cluster and you chose a different one. Um, so these notions still don't really get at sort of making a big scale mistake like the Clinton mistake versus small scale mistakes, but they're sort of distinguishing different decisions. Um, and some of these are worse than others. So in general, doing a wrong link is worse than doing a false new, because the false new kind of doesn't have the same knock-on effects that a wrong link has. 
Yeah, so what prior work had said is, okay, we have these sort of four kinds of things. They can actually be co-referent um, and done correctly, or you can make these three different kinds of errors. And so what we could do is manually set weights for these different kinds of errors and adjust them to try and maximize our score. And so Sam Wiseman had proposed doing that in a kind of a margin loss scenario so that we're taking um, the maximum choice of candidate antecedents um, for each mention. Um, and then here we have the usual kind of margin loss um, that we're looking at the score difference of the model for the true antecedent versus um, this candidate. Um, and they're both being scored by our current model. And so we're gonna to wanna to adjust the scores according to our model to sort of minimize that kind of um, large margin loss. But we add this one extra factor to our loss function, which we say is, well, scale how much it costs you to make this mistake based on what kind of an error you're making, which is sort of classifying it as one of these different kinds of errors. Okay, and so that kind of idea um, wasn't actually original to Sam Weissman. So really sort of a whole bunch of papers, really kind of just about all the co-ref papers that were done in the 2010s um, had used this kind of idea because it was a way to push up co-reference numbers a bit. Um, but you know, it doesn't seem perfect. Firstly, you have to do the hyperparameter search. And secondly, those error types, um, are a bit correlated with badness, but they don't seem to be very directly correlated with badness. And so Kevin was wanting to try and do things um, better than that. Um, and so these are the ways he approached it, and he introduced two approaches. So what we can say is when we're doing co-reference, um, what we're doing is we're taking a sequence of actions, and so each action is looking at one mention as we head through and choosing uh, something as it to be co-referent to, where one possibility is you're co-referent to new. And so you're making the sequence of actions, so you're deciding what to do with I, deciding what to do with Nader, deciding what to do with he, that these are your sequence of actions. And so what we'd like to do is choose the sequence of actions that maximizes getting a good um, co-reference clustering at the end of the day. So how do we decide what's a good co-reference clustering? Well, what we do is we actually just believe our metric, right? So I showed you the B cubed metric for co-reference and that seemed kind of sensible. It was sort of this F measure of getting your links right and precision and recall. So we call that our reward function. So if you, kind, if you get everything right, your B cubed metric is 100 um, or one, depending on whether you make it, you make it a percentage. And so we then have no loss. Um, and if you make some mistakes, we can then work out um, the reward for different co-reference algorithms. The reward will then be a lower reward corresponding to the B cubed score. And so Kevin explored two methods of doing this. One's the sort of the reinforced algorithm, which is the most common reinforcement learning algorithm in um, that's used in deep learning techniques and elsewhere, and then reward rescaling. Um, so for the reinforce algorithm, what you're doing is you're defining a probability distribution over actions. And the way he was doing that was sort of taking the scores from the mentioned pair model and exponentiating those and normalizing them. So sort of standard softmax um, function and saying that's the probability um, for taking different actions. And then what you're wanting to do is work out four action sequences with their probabilities, you want to um, maximize your expected reward. So the reinforced algorithm maximizes your expected reward. So you're taking the expectation over action sequences according to this probability distribution and then working out the reward, the B cubed score, for having taken that action sequence. Um, the problem is, of course, that there are sort of an, oops. Uh, 
The problem is that there are an exponential number of different action sequences that you can take here, and so you can't actually explore all of them, but what you can do is then sample trajectories to estimate that expectation and to approximate the gradient, and you can learn according to that. Um, so using the reinforcement, alg the reinforced algorithm for reinforcement learning, it basically worked. Um, it's sort of competitive with the sort of heuristic loss functions that people had found, but it sort of seemed to have a small disadvantage, which is that the reinforce algorithm maximizes performance and expectation, but that's not what we actually um, want here. We actually want to sort of maximize the highest scoring action sequence, because that's what we're actually going to use in practice. Um, so Kevin explored this other idea, which is to sort of say, well, Let's actually continue with this idea of incorporating rewards into the max margin objective slack rescaling, but instead of using these sort of handset hyperparameters like before, what we will do is actually we can work out how to set those, um, those sort of losses for rescaling the large margin objective. So the idea there is for our training data, we can actually just look at the effect of different decisions. So since each action is independent from every other action, you know, we can change one action and see what effect it had for the reward. So this is the correct set of actions where our reward is 100. And so we can just say for AI there, suppose we'd made that decision differently. Suppose we had said AI that declared that um, mention to be new. Well, we can just say, well, this is what our system returned. What's the B cube score for that? And the answer is 85. Um, and so our regret is 15 because we could have gotten the right answer in 100. And then we could say, well, let's consider a different possibility. We could have put my as co-referent to he. What's the B cube score then? And the B cube score is 66. And so now our regret is larger, our regret is 34. So we can actually empirically over the training data work out what the cost of different mistakes is in terms of B cube score. So then what we can do um, is sort of incorporate that um, so that now the sort of the scaling factor over our max margin loss function is being taken as the difference between the best action we could have taken at that point, which may no longer be the perfect action because we might have previously made mistakes versus um, the action that we did choose. So the, the cost is then sort of the regret for taking a particular action and that replaces the heuristic cost we used previously for actually what is the actual cost of this mistake in the context of a particular sentence. Okay, um, so that was the system, or well, the second system that was built, and so then this was evaluated on co-ref. So most of the recent work on co-reference has used, there were these Connell shared tasks in 2011 and 2012 for co-reference. Um, it was, um, it had English and Chinese in it, um, and these are scored with the sort of the Connell score. The people who did the Connell competition, I guess they didn't want to take sides as to which was the best metric for co-reference, so they came up with the Connell score for co-reference, which was actually just the arithmetic mean of three co-reference metrics, um, B cubed and two other ones. And so these are how things performed. So the kind of heuristic losses that people had used previously actually work quite well. So using the reinforce algorithm, you know, it's a, a, a smidgen better, but not really better than using the current heuristic loss functions. But what you could find is that um, using reward rescaling actually did work significantly better um, because um, you could then sort of actually use the real 
losses that were incurred in different environments. Um, now, these results and differences may not look very impressive, but that's partly because even the heuristic loss is being run on a good neural co-reference system. So I should also show you these other results um, just to give you a sense of things. Um, so this is the sort of progress that's really been made um, in co-reference resolution. So at the time of Connell 2012, the best Chinese system was this Chinning, which got 57. Um, on the Connell score, the best English system got 60. Um, there'd been some work um, on non-neural systems since then, so there was a better Chinese system and it was also a bit better in, um, on English um, in this system. Um, so the Wiseman was sort of the first neural system, so that was actually now starting to do a lot better. Um, and then here's um, Kevin's two systems, and it's sort of starting to get some decent gains beyond that going up. So the neural systems actually have given a nice new level of gain beyond previous um, co-reference systems. And so I just wanted to end in the last minute by saying, well, why is that? So one of the biggest gains is just the sort of general goodness of embedding. So one of the places where you get the biggest gains is what turns out to be one of the hardest cases of co-reference in practice is when you have these common noun nominals and you have to realize they're co-referent. And so that's things like the country's leftist rebels and the guerrillas, the gun, the rifle, um, two 16 sailors from the USS Cole, the crew, um, that these are the kind of ones that are very hard to get right if you're just doing a conventional system with word features and things like that. But that's precisely the kind of place where having our word vectors actually does give us some purchase, though these are still the hardest cases to get right. Um, but the other place you were getting gains is from using this reward rescaling algorithm. And the kind of interesting thing that the results actually turned out is compared to the heuristic loss function that using reward rescaling, that the reward rescaling system actually made more mistakes than the heuristic loss function. Um, but it was cleverer at deciding where to make its mistakes, and so it made mistakes that were less important. So even though it made more mistakes, Overall, it was able to achieve, achieve a better B cubed score by concentrating on making less important mistakes. And what that reflects the fact is that for different mistakes, there is a wide variety of different costs. So this is sort of an empirical graph of looking at all cases of false new, and then this is the distribution over how much they cost you. And even though, as you can see, that there's a clear mode to this graph, so if you're doing a heuristic loss, you'd say, okay, the cost of a false new is about 0 0.28 or something like that, that in, for different situations, there's an enormous distribution as to what the real cost of a false new is, and that's precisely what could be captured by the reward rescaling. Okay, that's it for co-reference, um, and then back on Thursday um, for doing the dynamic memory networks. <laughs>